Welcome to Money Congos, where we discuss personal finance and investment tips. We are committed to helping people create wealth and achieve financial freedom. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast. Alright then, let's head into today's conversation. Hi Adam, how are you doing? Ah, I'm good though. Wonderful. Yeah, it's great. It's nice to have you here. How's your week going? Uh, it's been fine. Today was a bit hectic, but it's, it's, it's been good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's these to have quite busy days for me. But today was actually relatively quite chill. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Eddie. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Yourself? I'm good. I'm good. How's your week going? Ah, it's been a good week. It's just that, I mean, I'm always looking forward to Friday. So, <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> tomorrow is right. fun. Yeah. But yeah, yeah all yeah. is well. How's your week been? Uh, Charlie, it's it's been it's been good. The with the with the quarter ending, there's just a whole lot of reporting in my industry to do. So, <laughs> just getting through that and. Uh, Hopefully this time we'll be able to do it in record time. So uh, at least there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. All right. So we'll be waiting for people to join, you know, the usual GMT. Um, Very normal. <laughs> yeah. So I just mute and ping in some people while we, uh, for over the next few seconds. No problem. Please go ahead. David, how are you doing? Hi, David. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sorry, I was, I, I, it turned out I was on mute. Okay, okay. I'm good. I'm good too. Good too. How, how's your week going? Hmm. <laughs> Master, you don't even <laughs> want to know. I, Yesterday, I heard something in the news recently. Uh huh. I heard something, some, some regulatory action recently. Oh man, it escaped me. But yeah, you tell me, what's, what's going on? Is it personal or it's work related? No, it's, it's personal. <clears throat> Yesterday, ah. they, they rained for here plenty. We ah. some small uh, dimsel catch we for here. <laughs> I, I wake up there, my, my basement turned into a swimming pool. You did lie. So if you had to work on I don't go work there today. Wow. Hey, I brought you yeah. some dimsel. Well, sick of the rain, no? Where did the power they flicker? They go on and off, on and off, on and off. So you mess up my. Um, I guess on machine B for the underground with the pump, Peter. all the water okay. come out. Okay. So the machine mess up with the water they collect plenty as the rain we flood my, my basement. Mm. Wow. So I, I, see. I, I hope for no electrical small. things. I hope no electrical things mess up. evolved that quick. Um, so far, so good. I am cleaning up the mess. Mm-hmm. Okay. We shall see. All right. All the best with that. Mm. You know, it's, it, it's interesting, but you know what, what you are talking about is it, quite related to the conversation we are coming to have. One of the questions I had posed to Eden ahead of this conversation is how bad can it get when, like, when you are building your house, right? Mm-hmm. And so I can imagine that if if you, the the home the house you are seeing right now was not uh, constructed well enough, it could probably the situation could have even been worse, right? For sure. Or for sure. What, what do you think? Oh, we, <laughs> well, I think one thing I I always say is um, you don't want to live in a poorly constructed building. Like it's a daily reminder every time you wake up. Mm-hmm when there is something wrong. For example, if there's something, there are some places you have some leakages and each time you keep repairing and keep repairing and keep repairing and it doesn't seem to go away. You don't want to get certain things wrong when you are building. Not at all. Interesting. Okay. Okay. But this whole building thing, eh? Mm-hmm. My, 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 um, my submissions seem to be a bit off, right? But, you know, over here, it's not as easy as it is in Ghana where 
you know, you go and build. If you hear somebody says, oh, I, I built my house up, then that person is like stupid dusted. I know, right? It, it, it almost never happens. Interesting. And David, why, why so? I'm sure we'll get into the specifics of that, but um, just just in the beginning, tell me, well, how, how is that the case in the US? Because you have to go buy the land, you know, you have to know, you know, it's, it's, it's more expensive. People do that when they're building their dream homes and it's more expensive that way. But if you're buying like a new construction, right, then you can go in there and, you know, do your specs and say, oh, me, my house, when you build it, I want you to put this in there, that in there and all that. So that could technically be you building your house. But no, that's not you saying, say, my Thomas has you know. I want this company to come and buy, uh, come and build it for me. The 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 format way in Ghana, you buy your land and then you have some mason B, and then you go hire some one person B here, and then gradually they put it together. No, that doesn't happen here. Hmm, interesting. It doesn't happen in the U.S. where the system is working no. two four seven. <laughs> yes, I guess y- y- you could say that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Anyway. Great. Yeah. Just before I introduce the topic and uh, speak our uh, experts for today, Mimi, a warm welcome mm. to you. How are you doing? Thank you, Alikem. I'm doing well. How are you doing yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, hello. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So, let's see. Today, we are answering a serious question. To buy or to build? Now, we are looking at your first home. Right. Um, considering our demographics, most of our audience are uh, from maybe students, university students to 40. David is the outlier at 69. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> um, that's the demographic. And people probably have homes or houses or real estate on their minds. And some, it's one of the um, largest purchases or largest use of money you'd make in your life. So it's, it's good that we have this conversation and see how to do it well. Besides inheritance, you know, where you can just get it for free. You To get your home, you may have to buy it or build it. So we need to get to the bottom of it. Of first, we have a, a name you may have seen if you are regular here on Clubhouse with us, Edem Danjo. He, Edem, did I pronounce your name well? Exactly so. Oh, nice. Nice. I don't speak it, but I guess I've not lost my roots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have Adam. He's, he, he comes up every now and then to ask questions or give comments. And he is a quantity surveyor. So he'll be talking more on the building side of things. And we have Edward Akwe. And he is a real estate expert, especially dealing with you know acquiring, helping people to buy and sell homes especially on the luxury end of things. So, Charlie, you can see from his DP that, Charlie, on Seha, you know. <laughs> so, um, he's going to share with us his expert tips on the topic of how to buy a home, things to note. So, yeah, we'll be getting into that conversation. But, yeah, to our expert, let's start with Edem, then we'll go to Edward. Any opening thoughts for us? Um, okay, so, good evening to everyone. And um, basically, like you said, I think this is um, an area that is about about the most monies that people commit of their resources into any projects like this of this kind. So, um, whether it's purchasing or it is building your own house, I believe that it's a very very important um, task or project you're going to embark on, and should not be taken kind uh, lightly at all. And whatever it is that you need to do, put in the research and use the right people so that in the end, what you get out of it is something that is satisfying to you and not one that will constantly be reminding you of um, the mistakes you have made. So I just would want to sum up and say that projects are quite complex or can be simple, but once you use the right professionals, um, you can be able to achieve the aim that you have. So I just want to keep it short so that we move straight into the, the specific of the questions. Yeah. 
Okay, great. So it's not to be taken lightly. You need the right people to be able to get the project done well. Okay, thank you, Adam. Eddie, how about you? Any opening thoughts? Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Good evening and to everyone on the call. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Opening thoughts for me would be, um, I think I have a lot of experience dealing with first-time home buyers as well. So, I mean, as the conversation goes on, I'll share some of the tips that you need to note. But one of the main things I'll tell everyone on the call is that, please, when it comes to this whole conversation, don't try to cut corners. Most of the problems that come up after this decision is done is because most people try to cut corners here and there and fail to obviously also involve professionals because they don't want to pay professional fees. When I say professionals, I mean agents or brokers and also lawyers. So then it comes back to haunt them and now they do a bad deal and they can never sleep for the rest of their lives. So it's going to be a very interesting discussion. There's quite a lot to share. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Charlie, that was a good one. Don't cut corners. I, I remember when uh, some years ago I bought a nice flashy car. Uh, it had front damage. No, no, the front damage had affected the transmission. Charlie, it was a nice. You are sitting in a nice car, but Charlie, it's broken inside. <laughs> had to sell it for scraps. So I can, I know it's, 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 uh, a home is way bigger than a house, but I can totally relate. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. So you heard it uh, from Eddie. Don't cut corners. Be willing to pay for the right people to get things done else. You pay through your nose later. Pay up front rather than later. Okay, so let's start. Let's let's move on and get into the pros and cons of buying or build, building. But let's start with um let's start with buying. So Eddie, back to you. Would you want to give us a conclusion for starters? Like is, is the answer that simple? Should we just go ahead and buy? Or what or should we is there an it depends kind of situation? Okay, very interesting question. It would always depend on the buyer because both sides have their pros and cons. But if I'm being realistic with the way Accra is going right now, we have a lot of, let me give you some facts. 60% of cases in our course today are all land related. That is already a red flag if you are looking to buy land to build your dream house or to build your first house because the process can be cumbersome. We have a land commission that, you know, has its duties daily, but some way, somehow, everything that goes through there takes forever. And if you don't have some connection there, my guy, your case, your, you know, your, your paperwork can be pending for three, six months, nine months. And next thing you know, you go on your land and there's some land guard waiting for you. Buying land to build your house can be cumbersome in a part of this world. Nonetheless, it's not to say it's impossible, but it comes back to my point. If you involve the right property professionals, which is lawyers that will do the right due diligence for you and make sure the paperwork is right and involve the right brokers that will lead you to the right properties, it can become, you know, hassle free. But I always advise my clients based on budget and location or preference that please, if you can afford to buy, just buy. The beauty of buying is that now we have options which we call off-plan. So off-plan project simply means that it is under construction. They are not done yet. So you still get to influence choice of tiles, you know, color of kitchen, you know, you get to influence the finishing so that even though you are buying from a developer, it's being finished to your taste and preference. Now, so for me, from both angles, unless I break down the pros and cons for everyone on this call, which I can do very quickly, at the end of the day, you will have to make that decision. But based on your location and your budget, if you can afford to buy, save yourself the wahala. Because let's just say you got the land, everything is smooth, and you have to build it step by step. You and I know the problem with our construction these days from dealing with workers that are not motivated you know, you can go to your side tomorrow morning, 100 iron rods are missing. Construction has its own problems because you are always going to deal with people on site who are not really, you know, educated here and there and minimum wage in Ghana doesn't motivate them to do the work. So you have the vision of what your house should look like, but the guys on site can always misbehave. So for me, I always advise people that if you can buy, please buy. But nonetheless, it can be very expensive to also buy. So let me just run through quickly what I'll say pros and cons of, of, of um, so let me start with pros of building your own home. It can cost you less to live in it. It can cost you less to also maintain it because everything is new. 
you know um there's also no competition from other buyers because sometimes you see a house you want to buy but if you don't look sharp or if you're not quick with the transaction somebody else might buy it now when you also when you also build your own house it, you'd always get a better resale value because it's a new house and generally you know the wear and tear on the house is at least 10 years you know so you can look at it from that angle now the cons of building your own home it can take you so much more time and it can also be very expensive if you don't have the right professionals you also have to handle every little expense what do i mean by that from foundation air condition plumbing electrical finishing roofing fixtures everything is on your head okay and then one of one of the things i always say is that when you are also building your own house sometimes you might have a house that becomes dated when you are looking to resell it because trends can fade quickly all right and then the final thing i also say is that when you are buying when you are building your own house sorry you also don't have a lot of options for negotiation you know negotiation on prices so sometimes you are left with you know getting stuck with making a decision where you don't have any options to compare because at the end of the day if you have this land this is what you are building on there's no comparable all right now let me give you the pros of buying and then the cons and then you'll make your own decision after this call now buying it can cost you less to buy when it you're buying from a developer because they have what we call um um, um payment plans which can make it more effective for you now trusted developers can also make it easier for you to get your mortgages mortgage processes you know go through because most banks like to work with trusted developers not a single hundred a diaqua trying to build a house somewhere on his own you know because there might be no guarantees that it will actually go as planned i don't have a track record but if i'm dealing with let's say a gold key properties which is 25 years old in our market they have a track record so the bank can easily facilitate okay um let me give you a few cons um for buying it's always going to be harder to also negotiate with new construction most developers have a certain price that they want to achieve to make a profit so the negotiation can be so hard when it's brand new it's so 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 hard and i do this often with clients so it's always hard i mean you might hide you might find a property which is let's say two hundred thousand dollars and the guy is willing to take only six thousand dollars off max can you imagine but these things happen then also one of the cons of buying is that sometimes you might also have you know construction happening around you so you are ready to move in but everybody else next to you they are still building so there's a lot of you know dust noise and all that and then the final thing is that there might be other fees that you also have to pay when you buy most of the apartments townhouses we see in town come with something called a service charge it takes care of your common area maintenance your cleaning your security landscaping and all that whereas if you bought your land and you built you might not have these costs where you have to share these um, fixed service charges with other um, tenants or homeowners in the locality so um, i think i'll rest my case for now um would we'll take it up as the conversation goes on thank you that's a good one it's, it's, it's a good debate for it you left some of us scratching our heads but like okay okay then, then building is winning then now we are about buying and there's a whole different ball game and everything and with this pros and cons interesting points you've raised adam i hope the wind hasn't been taken out of your seals uh, oh for, yes on the I, I, I believe eddie has done justice to everything i think i will just add a few things like he said it's it's very dependent on you. Um, for someone, a buy decision will be a very good decision. But for somebody else, a build decision might be the best decision to go based on your circumstances and all that. You know, all this is also related and tied into um, our own personal finance decisions. So it's like I said in the beginning, it's not something to be taken lightly. You don't just jump on the, with the bandwagon and say, okay, Maybe it's, it's invoked. Like he said, if you get to build and then there's litigation, it can be very, 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 very stressful and traumatic. Imagine how how long some cases drag in court. So you just want to get everything right. But like he said, with buying, you can have options, like various options. Maybe there's an estate that is being sold 
um, different different options you can get the one that you want with building to in our parts of the world i think one reason why many people are go for the option of building is probably because of the capital intensiveness of projects and the amount of money you need so sometimes um, it's easier for people to take it on a piecemeal basis and manage the process in a slow manner and be able to achieve what they want so that one gives you that flexibility okay and another advantage of buying i would say is that um you get to move in quickly unlike when you are building you are building it might take you as much as five years depending on how your cash flow forecasts are so with buying you could get to move in quickly but with um building you don't get to move in immediately until the building is done so that's another aspect now with building advantages of building as i said earlier you are able to handle it at your own pace so you can take your time and finish it you also have a control some control over um the work that you are doing in terms of um which professionals you are choosing and whatever what have you then you can also um gain some useful experiences through the, the 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 whole process of building actually it can be interesting when you are going through it yourself um, you, you can also gain some good uh, uh, um, experience you can also um easily choose probably the location you want for your uh, um your building because maybe you want uh, a building probably cantonments or something, but um, all the buildings, they don't seem to fit into your budget. So if it's to build and you have, it's it might be easier to come across maybe the vacant plot of land to buy than to get a building that suits your taste and meets your needs. Now with the cons of building, that's where I want to focus on a little bit. Like Eddie said, I think it's one of the most stressful things anybody will do in their lives uh, when you are building. One, you are dealing with statutory authorities. To get your permits can be a whole lot of stress. Then you would have to deal with artisans. Then sometimes you also have to deal with professionals. Okay, unfortunately, you might also have to contend with professionals too. And so the whole process of building can be very, very, very stressful and then also the kinds of costs that spring up as you are building things you never anticipated can just show up from any corner then you also risk um cost overruns okay you start off with a budget of let's say maybe three hundred thousand cds you know this building i will be done in three hundred thousand cds and by the time you are done you spent maybe four hundred or four hundred and fifty thousand probably because of the increases in prices like i was sharing with you earlier some projections i made some budgets i made for some clients earlier this year just by march you had to revise everything again because of the increases in prices so it's a big problem that you have then you can also think about pilfering and theft it's one big problem just this evening when i was returning from one client's site there was an issue that the one guy was sharing with me. Somebody they've delivered some materials to the site and it was counted before it was taken to store. By this morning, there's shortage. So where did the rest, where did those materials pass? And these are some of the things you'll be contending with if you especially don't have um, proper systems to, 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 to deal with these issues. So I think I would like to just add this and then we can move on with the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Amazing. Um, I think I have a suggestion about the, the materials that's gone missing. I think they may have evaporated. Ghana may be really, really hot. So <laughs> that's boiling point. Obviously, it's one of the articles, <laughs> but we are now investigating to see who it is. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Amazing. Charlie, that kind of stress, that kind yeah. of stress. You know, just uh, an aside, when I, I remember when my mother was building a house in Abukubi, we, we, one night we, we had gone to the site 
for some yeah we had gone to the site after school she picked me up after school we went to the site looked at everything everything was okay then we were coming back and we, when we go to legon at that time they were constructing the road at some point if i i mean in fact this many years ago for some reason we had to turn back only to turn back and then some land guards had come to break the wall and new owners of the land long story short we had to pay for the land again right <laughs> so i remember how how emotional my mother got when that was happening Charlie. Mm. it wasn't fun at all eddie you wanted to add something no 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 please go ahead okay yeah so charlie it's i i can relate to some of these experiences that you've both raised all right so pros and cons guys you heard it it's not a simple answer it's i know you wish that when you come to money convos all your solutions all, all your problems will be solved by the wave of a wand or a simple answer but like all things with human beings it all depends it depends on your unique needs all right so zooming a little more into the building um adam you mentioned that you'd have to contend with professionals and you'd have to contend with uh, artisans so for a building project who are some of the professionals you have to engage let's let's start from the point of perhaps you've bought the land already so moving on from there okay so once you have sorted out all your documentation with your land and everything and then you Basically, for every project, we say the very first um, stage in the project is the initiation stage, where or conceptualizing stage, where the whole idea of the project comes up. The first person you need to speak to will be um, an architect. It's very, very important to speak to an architect. The architect is the one who will process your, um, your thoughts and your ideas and translate it into appropriate designs for you that and the designs are basically more like instructions telling the people who are building how to go about it and build exactly what you are looking for so an architect is key in you in, in your development and for most people um the architect might play the role throughout until the project is is, is, is done okay for uh, for the average person, especially we are talking about a first home, I don't see it to be a very big project or very huge thing. So an architect might suffice because um, they have the power to sign, I think, up to two-story buildings or so. Yeah, so they can sign off on designs for two-story buildings. So the regular single-story buildings we see all around and two-story buildings. And when you say two-story, it means a ground floor and then a first floor. Okay, that's a two story. So an architect can design that and sign off on everything for that. And it's good to go for permitting. In the cases where, especially where you have um, to go more than two stories, even I would recommend that if you are going more than one story, you should involve a structural engineer for all the other structural elements. When you say a structural engineer, basically the one who is going to design the building to ensure that it stands. Uh, structural elements are things like what we call the uh, the columns, which is what the layman calls pillars, and then the beams. Okay, the beams, and then the floor, the the suspended floor, the floor that comes on top of the one that is down. All those have to be designed for. So the structural engineer will be doing that that kind of work. Then you have a quantity surveyor like myself, whose job basically comes in to deal with costs and. Uh, budget issues okay to prepare your budgets and um, there's a famous scripture that we always quote when we are dealing with our stuff you know jesus christ was talking about if you want to build a tower which of you will not sit down and uh, take uh, count the cost and then see if you have enough resources to do it uh -huh. so if you want to embark on a project you necessarily i mean this is money congress so we need to necessarily know how much is going to go into this project and to do that you need a qualified person, that's the quantity surveyor, who will help you to decide how much, whatever it is that has been designed will cost. And can go further to break it down in terms of materials and um, labor and all of the things that you would require and how to face it even in a cash flow form. So you know when you need how much, uh, how much you need at whatever time during the project. Then also there are some other people like the services engineers where you can have an electrical engineer and a mechanical engineer 
where they would give inputs when it comes to your wiring and all of that and then also your plumbing systems and if you have any air conditioning or cooling systems you would be putting in the building these people are very very important but often in ghana we don't tend to think about them until we get to the point where we are dealing with these type of things and just like um david said is it david that said earlier on that the flooding there was a machine that's pumping you know some of these one of the difficult things you can deal with is when you have plumbing issues in your building i mean it's not that fun at all so you need to get these people in early through the design process so that whatever you come up with will be your designs will be solid and your projects will go on smoothly so i think these are the main uh, professionals and then these professionals will work hand in hand with different artisans um, during the project so i think that that should cover for that okay okay adam thank you so much um just a little uh, housekeeping uh, so if um, if you have any questions um in case you just joined we are having a conversation about whether to buy or to build your first home and we have a, a, a demand expert quantity surveyor speaking on building and we have eddie aqua who is an uh, an expert in real estate sales so if you want to uh, buy he would he would be a good expert for you and we so far we've been talking about the pros and cons and we started talking about the people you need to involve in the process and if you have any questions i see quiet storm has a question kindly drop it in the chat or just or hold on for us so if you if you see that we've not brought you up just yet please uh, bear with us we want the uh, question uh, the planned conversations to flow for a while then we invite some questions but if it's immediate you can just drop it in the chat or in uh, private messages so that we bring it up in the conversation. All right, so um, continuing with what you just said, Adam, just a follow-up question. You know, you've, you've mentioned that these people are important and I, I had some experience in sometime September, October, 2020, when I was looking to build a house and I actually got an architect to do the designs and all. And my mother was like, Look at all these thousands of CDs you are giving an architect to do all these designs. See, bring 700, we get a draftsman. They, they do it for the architects. They do it all the time, right? Then uh, just like, do you know how many bags of cement this thing will buy? Um, trying to get a mechanical engineer in this. It's like, nah, don't do this, don't do that. So Adam, I, I get that there is a, there's a need for them. But could you perhaps give uh, some real vivid examples of Real, uh, things that could go wrong if we don't involve these people perhaps to, to help people be motivated or see the importance of having these uh, professionals in there okay well what could go wrong that is basically what <laughs> uh, 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 you are you're asking um well um at the moment for your designs or your drawings to be approved for permitting purposes it has to be signed off by an architect. Okay. And then where there is um, there are major structural issues, you also need a structural engineer to sign off on those structural drawings. Okay, so from the get go, I know many people in Ghana build without permits, so that's why they get away with um, a lot of things. Okay, but um, I think Eddie said something at the beginning that in these matters. Try not to cut corners because it will come back and hit at you strongly. Um, so, for example, you know, the, um, let's take, there's a very simple example that I want to use. For example, you have a, a building, okay, or let's say a room, okay, four meters by four meters, okay. That gives you um, 16 square meters. Then you also have another room, eight meters by two meters when you multiply the area you get 16 square meters but you know that the perimeter of the four meters by four meters is also 16 um was 16 meters because it's four meter round so four plus four plus four plus four i mean sorry for the mathematics for those who don't like but and then if you take the same um eight by two okay you are getting 20 meter perimeter 
Okay, so in terms of block work alone, okay, just by having a designer who has all these issues about um, um, building economics in mind, trying to design your building for you, for a space of 16 square meters, somebody just drawing lines, putting it eight meters by two meters, another person doing four meters by four meters, already saves you a certain amount of money because if you are looking at perimeter wise, it means you are going more blocks for the eight meters by two meters more than if you are doing four meters by four meters okay and these are some of the design considerations people don't see that goes into how buildings are designed so people just feel that um oh yeah there's a draftsman somewhere he can just draw yes they are there they draw but they don't design and there's a big difference between drawing and designing okay because the design aspect is to make the building usable and for also um thinking in about costs considerations so when they come when an architect comes up with a design it's not as if they just drew one line and put another line beside it so oh just take some 700 and pay somebody no there are lots of considerations go into what they do some people have lived in a building which was designed by an architect and i've lived in a building which was designed by a craftsman and i know the difference you know there are some of the buildings they are not user friendly and you see, oftentimes too, we think about cost just about one time cost, but for us as quantity surveyors, we think about cost in terms of the life cycle of the building. So you could have something that costs cheaper today because you didn't use an architect or a structural engineer or anything. But in the long run, what is the life cycle cost? Because the building is going to last you probably like 50 years. What is the life cycle cost of the building or the, the elements that you are having? So when you think about these things, it makes you realize that some people design their buildings and then you or put up a building and you cannot sit in the building in the afternoon because it's so hot so you need to put in some extra ventilation measures like ac must run on throughout just because they didn't consider certain issues like orientation in in designing the building so these are some of the little 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 things that go on and worst case for me is where it has to do with structural elements Okay, even determining how many iron rods to put in, um, let's say a pillar, as the ordinary person would say, or a slab, calculations are done. It's not because Mr. Kofi had three iron rods in his beam, so you are also going to do three. No, calculations are done. And the worst case scenario you don't want is a building collapsing or some major defects happening, and you have to keep repairing and incurring a lot of costs. So Eddie has already said this thing in the beginning, just don't cut corners. As I said, it is one of the major things you would use your money for in your life, in your building, or whether you are buying. It's one of the most capital intensive things that individuals would do. So let's get it right from the beginning. Use the right professionals and just don't skip corners. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So don't you want a house that is user friendly not one that you always have to run an ac which could have just been avoided by better design better placement of windows and whatnot thank you so much eddie uh, thank you so much Adam. Ha, huh, interesting Adam and edward okay all right please we didn't share that with that okay it happened by chance maybe if if your name starts with ed you probably be a good real estate person <laughs> okay eddie how about you um the, the, you, you, you alluded to some professionals that we should engage with, lawyers, um, good brokers. Perhaps do you want to get, get more detailed and why their uh, importance, preferably by sharing some experiences that people have gone through? Great question. Thank you. Yes, please. So on the sales side, for us, um, I mean, first and foremost, you have to engage a good agent, a quality agent you know, a professional agent. And I'll give you, I mean, how to, a, a few tips to choose the right agent, okay? Now, for me, the first thing, the first three principles in our business is we, we say trust, honesty, and integrity, okay? So you can do a bit of research. I mean, every agent should have a track record. Unfortunately, in Ghana, we don't have what we call like a property database and all that. We are not there yet, but we can always ask around. Word of mouth is powerful and in our business is a referral business. So somebody must have encountered him if he's that good, you know? And then you also want to look out for an agent or, or a broker 
who communicate well and regularly with their clients. Communication is key in our business. Very important. Now, you also have to look for somebody who is very knowledgeable in their market. He knows the market. He can give you the advice. He can give you comparable data. He can guide you. You know, our business, I always say, we are not just selling. We are guiding you through the process. We are literally holding your hand. Okay. Another thing that's very important is that you need to find somebody who is a good listener. You know, somebody who can listen to what you need and be able to match it with the right options and the right properties. Um, you also want to have somebody who works within your budget and your time frame. It's very, very important. Okay. And it's also good to know, um, so you, you also have to know somebody who understands your, um, you know, the motivation and your finances. Okay. So when you encounter professionals, I always tell people, just be honest. Don't meet me and tell me, oh, I want to buy a house in Cantonment and I have my budget is $700,000. We show you the house. And then when it comes to paying, it becomes stories on stories on stories and you probably don't even have the money. Just be honest. If you are window shopping from day one, let them know, oh, I'm not ready yet. I'll be ready in October, but I want to have an idea of the market. I want to see some options. It's better to be honest because if you expect your professional to be honest with you, as a client, you also have to be honest. Now, let me skip to let me move on to the lawyers. The reason why lawyers are important is that, like I said, 60% of our court cases are land related. Okay. Now, everything in property is law. You are not going to buy a property and not sign a sales and purchase agreement or have documents transferred in your name. So lawyers are key. If you cut or you do shortcuts and you skip them, it will come back to you. I, I can promise you this on any day. So let's let's understand why we are engaging these professionals in the first place. As for lawyers, once again, it's back to the same things I said. Good track record. You know, you want to know what they've done in the past. You want to know that they are also, you know, it's, it's not every lawyer that is very good in the property industry. Some of them, it's not their field. So the fact that your cousin is a lawyer doesn't necessarily mean that your cousin should handle your property purchase or sale process are you getting it so do your research look for the right people in the industry engage them and please let me say this on this call when the professional charges you their fee respect it because it's they are bringing value to the table so it's not as if they are just telling you that they are charging you five percent because they feel like saying five percent that's what they are worth and that's what the fee is and i always say this to clients if you are going to um you know let's say buy a car okay and then they go you maybe let's say you go to the jaguar showroom example and then they say okay fine the car cost hundred thousand dollars you know and then there's a fee of maybe one percent for transaction or registration and all that you don't tell them that i won't pay that one percent at the end of the day you still have to pay it because there's a process to get the car transferred into your name you have to have a car number you have to have insurance all that stuff so in as much as we have to engage the professionals, let's also respect them and pay them their worth. And together, we can make the dream come true. Thank you. Good one there. Pay them their worth. So, Eddie, what what kind of uh, what kind of percentages are we looking at for the brokers and the lawyers? Okay, good question. Um, brokers typically for a sale, we 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 brokers will charge anything between three to five percent. Okay. As okay. an as a commission fee or a professional fee. Yes. For lawyers it varies. It depends on what you need them to do. So the, the sale the sale process has different elements. So let me run you through um bits of it. Um depending on what documents govern the property you are looking to buy, okay, there will be some documents that you need. So some of them might have land title document. Some might not even have a land title document, but they might have a deed of assignment. So based on the documents governing the property, the lawyer would then be able to say, okay, if you need me to do this, transfer the assign or assign um, this property from buyer A to from seller A to buyer B, this is the cost. But legal charges, to be very honest, I always say that when you look at the value you get from lawyers, even lawyers, we, they don't even charge as much. It's pretty much friendly, but it can be anything between 5 to about 12%, depending on the task involved. Okay, so you can keep that in mind. It can be anything between 5 to 12% of the, 
and this is on the um it can be on the value of the property or the value sorry the value of the house or the value of the land so depending on the lawyer you are engaging it can be anything between five to twelve percent but don't forget that every fee you've heard is also negotiable thank you good points there so uh, i see that chief cosmos is putting in the chat that you should pay eddie well He's bringing good value to us, so you guys, we need to pay him very Thank well. Thank you, my brother, service. Cosmos. <laughs> the job is the job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then, you know, these numbers get me thinking, and I'm like, so we should all need to be aware when we are going to buy a house that if it's listed at, I, I wouldn't say $700,000. No, no, no. Let's calm down for money convos. Like, if it's listed at $70,000, $50,000, you can expect to spend another looking at the brokers three to five lawyers five to twelve you can be expecting to spend roughly 10 to 15 or so percent more to make sure that you are securing the deal that you are doing so if it's fifty thousand dollars estimate sixty five thousand to spend you know so don't just go in there thinking it's six is fifty thousand and you know what it's, it's like purchasing cars i'm sure by for for most people by the time they're acquiring a house they would probably have engaged in buying a car at least once or twice or even seeing people buying a car it's like you go they see the car is fifty thousand. okay now you have to do the registration like you were saying you do the registration all those things in fact if it's if it's a home use car or uh, someone else's car you want to do servicing you know i remember my current car i paid someone uh, who's a mechanical engineer to go and test the car he said he went to do donuts with the car shaking my head but anyway yeah you know you have to all those costs Charlie, will come up to like some two cool three to five k you know meanwhile you didn't plan for it and now it's left with what you used to buy petrol so don't be shocked by that if the listing price is fifty thousand, expect to spend another 10 to 15 percent securing the deal you are doing okay so let's um let's take at this point let's take a question from Quiet Storm. He's been itching to ask a question for a while. So, Quiet Storm, please do come up and ask your question. While we get him, uh, while we get him ready to come up, I would just pose the next question to Adam. And the the question is: um, You mentioned that there there could be some unexpected expenses or there could be situations of uh, where someone um, was it unexpected yeah uh, costs going up right i'm curious one benefit another benefit you mentioned with building is you could have a customized um, a customized design as you are building when you keep changing is it possible to keep changing your designs in between like You've started, you've done the foundation all right, but you want to change some designs. Okay, this now you want the bedroom to face this way or the door should be here. Or now you want a balcony somewhere that you hadn't properly planned for it. Is it is it advisable to do that? Is it expensive to do that? Like at which point do you have to say no, no means no, stick to the plan, you know? Just be thinking about that while we take okay. a quiet storm's question. Quiet storm, welcome and please go ahead with your Question. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So my question is, um, how come all the houses that are being sold in Ghana are being quoted in dollars? I, I don't understand because we, we don't spend dollars in Ghana. We spend cities, right? So, uh, I mean, I don't understand that. Can somebody explain that to me? Because Can I answer this question? <laughs> yes, I do. But before, before you even do is, is this this table that quiet storm is shaking there i must comment Charlie. you are going to uh, ruffle some feathers right oh, Eddie, what do you think <laughs> oh me i'll just i'll just i'll just break it down you know it's a good question it's a good question we get it sometimes so why not yeah so can yes, i go ahead go ahead okay now it comes back to basic fundamentals of economics the problem you see that the, the reason why you are seeing those things in our markets is this we have a currency that is very unstable 100 percent, very unstable so if i put a property up example in december at hundred thousand dollars which was maybe five eighty thousand ghana cities dollar rate 5.8 
today, March, I have a buyer. That same hundred thousand dollars is not what was in December. The you lose drastically. So the reason why people quote in dollars is to hedge against all these currency fluctuations as well as inflation. So that if you are ready to make the transaction today, you are given the exchange rate on the day. If we don't do that, <laughs> we'll have problems in our market. And you should always look at it from the other side, not just the fact that because you are a buyer, you want the best deal. Think about the developer. He bought cement at example 45 cities in december march cement is 60 cities who is paying for that difference are you getting it so all those things are factored into it and that's why people could i'm not saying it's the best thing to do it's just how our market is because if it's not done like that most of the time the developers on the other side will really lose and nobody wants to go into that sort of business and incur losses because it's already a capital intensive um, industry and if you're not able to hedge against these things, you would always lose. I, I, I overheard, I think, um, Adam saying um, that he gave a client a quote, whatever, sometime in December, and then they've had to revise it in March. Everything is going up. The whole construction process has become, you know, it's through the roof. So this is why you keep seeing things in dollars. But nonetheless, if you're ready to make payments, you'd always be given the exchange rate, or we call it the prevailing rate on the day. And then you can make your payment. It might not be in your best interest. It might not be what you would like to hear. But the truth is, if it's not done, um, parties in the value chain will suffer. And it's going to be a very hard one. So, um, yeah, that's what that's what I have to say on that. Interesting. I see. Um, Adam, did you also want to add on to it or Eddie has done justice? I think Eddie has said almost, but just like um, he said, you know, the construction industry is very dependent on imports, and we don't import things in cities. So that is, I, for the developers, that is what I see. Um, like he said something, you would want to always think about the developer and the client. For me as a QS, I normally sit in the middle, try to look at things from both sides. So if, if you look at it from the developer's point of view, you would understand why they would want like he said, it's not the best. We would have actually want to be able to quote things in CDs. But just like mortgages, if you go to the um, um, the banks, you see that they are more comfortable, you know, dealing with that dollar mortgage than to come and come and be dealing with CD mortgages where the interest rates has to be changing all the time or something like that. So um, until some of these things are fixed, I think it will be with us for, for a while. Uh, so that's that's what I, 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 I see. Ah, interesting take you just introduced in the Adam. I'm quite some. I, I appreciate that you, you want your follow up, but I, I want to comment on it before so that you can have more context to follow back on, right? Um, on the banks, the even if if you charge a if if it's a CD mod gauge rate, uh, the rate will be fixed. So the banks they have their way that they can hedge these things. In fact, with the dollar, they get even less money with the dollar on a normal day. Um, so the yeah, on a normal day they get less money, right? Uh, this this issue allow me to be uh, to play devil's advocate on this, right? Just a few days ago, the Bank of Ghana issued a circular. I just re-downloaded it to to read it, and basically it all boils down to prohibition of pricing advertising, receipting, and or making payments for goods or services in foreign currency in Ghana. Pardon me, must be a noisy neighbor. Yeah. So prohibition of transactions in foreign currency in Ghana. I encourage everyone to just look it up and read, right? And it's 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 not good, it's not the best because it has effects on our currency. And sometimes the the methods that we use as an, uh, to try and counteract the C or to respond to the CD's depreciation is the same uh, activity that will cause uh, the CD to depreciate more, right? So the Bank of Ghana steps in to try and prevent these kind of activities. On the issue of rising costs, and there's not only real estate that does this, Pro even professional services do this. I'm like, if, if your concern is rising costs, we know that's, that's inflation. So 
if you ex if you be okay with taking let's say five hundred thousand for something, okay, why not price it at five hundred and fifty thousand so that uh, if it will take a few months for you to get there before you reprice it, that's fine. Or you just go straight ahead and do it six hundred thousand. If you if you're able to sell at six hundred thousand, you pocket it. You know th that may be more helpful. It's and it may help even the economy, the general economy, and all of us, as opposed to pegging it to the dollar. But I guess at this point, it's just at this point, it's just banter, and it's, we leave it up to the authorities to to decide on what's what's the best way to do. And I must also add that the Bank of Ghana allows for certain exemptions. And I know the real estate industry has fought for some exemptions for a while. So it's it's really about making a good case to the Bank of Ghana to make these things allowable. Yeah, Quiet Storm. Yeah. <laughs> that's an interesting name you have there. If you don't mind, share. oh, I see. Oh, Jojo Bangi. Okay, that's your that's your full name, Jojo Bangi. Jojo, please, you can go ahead with your um, your follow up question. Yeah. So um, I may mean, understand uh, uh, what um, who answered my question. That's that's uh, Eddie. Was it Eddie? Yeah. Okay, Eddie. Yeah, I understand what Eddie said and all, but my thing is, how come they can't? Uh, quote in the city's equivalent. I don't. I don't understand that. I mean, I get what the issue is and the reasons why they are quoting in dollars and all that. But can they quote in the city's uh, uh, equivalent? Yeah. I, just if I may paraphrase what Eddie said, and perhaps Eddie can correct me if I'm wrong. If if the quote in uh, city terms, the city equivalent, the price will keep changing on a daily basis. To be like full of prices, every two weeks you go to have changed. <laughs> Already, no be so. Exactly what it is. I mean, I don't think that I can imagine having to update my website every morning for hundred properties with prices changing every morning. It, it's it's cumbersome. It's just tough, you know. And like like um, Adam Riley said, some of these things is beyond us. It's not because we woke up and decided to do things like that. It's it's the system we came to meet. The fundamentals governing it imports uh our construction industries you know backed by a lot of imports door we import literally i mean it's it's ridiculous you know so it comes back to it, it's it all comes back into the price that the property is being sold at and so everybody wants to hedge if you don't hedge you will lose you know you will lose i mean i'll give you an example i i i, I sold a property and i gave a client an invoice end of february dollar rate was 6.8 and he wanted it in CDs. So I, I quoted the dollar and I put the dollar rate and I put the CD. Expecting to get payment in a few, you know, three to five days. This payment came at the end of March. And by the day he was paying, the rate had gone from 6.8 to 7.7. .7. Now, if I didn't do that exchange rate conversion, I would have lost about maybe four or 5,000 CDs. And this is just within 30 days. So you can see the impact on on the whole construction, you know, um, value chain. It's tough. Trust me, my brother. I'm not happy that we quote properties in dollars. The first time I got into the industry, I was asking all these questions to you. I didn't understand why, but once you start to engage, you know, people like Adam in the industry, the imports, so they're importing something from China. It's X amount. They are doing it the following week. It's gone up. It's ridiculous. It's tough. So it comes back to a lot of, you know, things that are beyond us. It has to do with the economy, you know, all those things, inflation, you know, things that are beyond you and I. So it's unfortunate, but that's the system we find ourselves in. So, yeah, it's tough, but what can we do? I'm sure one day if there's a will, we'll make a way. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's tough and we have to make it work with what we have for now. Great. Okay, let's, um, I've invited up Chief. Chief, um, you can come up now uh, so that we hear your contribution to the conversation. And while we wait for Chief to come up, Adam, you remember my question I asked earlier? Yes, or, about, or so, about changes. Yes, exactly, about changes. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, Adam, sorry, just one second. Um, Jojo, are you okay yeah, with that? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay, okay, but I have one more question. I'm at work, so I just want to ask this question real quick, and then I'm I'm out of here. I beg. Okay, sure. Right, okay, so right. so I'm in the process of building in Ghana, right? So the guy that is building my my house for me uh, sent sent me an email and told me that uh, um, 
like I'm trying to get the permit. You know how when you, you, you're building, you have to get the permit and then they give you a receipt and then you can build with that receipt while you wait for the document to be ready, right? So he sends me an email and says, um, well, they're saying that I need to pay 4,000 Ghana cities because one, I didn't inform the authorities about building a wall around my land. And then also, uh, yeah, the, 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 there's a penalty for building a wall without letting them know. And then also they are charging me 4,000 Ghana cities for, to do the, the, the permit. I'm not sure how true this is. If somebody can you know, tell me how true this is, because it's like a back and forth, back and forth with this person, and I'm not trying to pay that 4,000 Ghana cities. So. Adam, I guess this is right down your alley. Yeah. Um, well, before you do any development on any uh, uh, land or property of yours, you need a permit. Okay. And there's a penalty for doing any development without a permit. So, but as to how much is to be charged, I, I can't be sure because every um, assembly and probably how they, they go about it. So, in, in, in that instance, I'm not, I will not be surprised if it, it is true, but there's, there's a penalty for developing without a permit, even if it's a fence wall. Before you put any block on any piece of land, you need a permit. It's just that, like with everything else, especially in construction is like the most unregulated uh, space in our country, where people do too many things on their own. And but sometimes in certain assemblies you can't get away with this thing. They will chase you all and they will worry you until you pay these monies. So um, there is definitely a penalty for developing without um, a permit. As to the quantum, I am not too sure about. Yeah. So if there is a way of finding, a, uh, getting a third party to cross-check that amount for you, that might be perfect. Yeah, that's actually what I'm doing right now. So. Yeah. But Perhaps, as for the uh, penalty, it's true. There, there is a penalty for that. Okay. Jojo, I would strongly encourage you to DM uh, Adam on the site so that he can get his contact okay. and maybe he can find out where your house is located. I don't want to ask, you know, for privacy reasons. I don't want to ask yeah. you. So you can message him on the, on the side so that he can help you get to the bottom okay. of it. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Dick. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Adam, I have to postpone that question again. We've got Chief no, up here no with problem. us. <laughs> We've got Chief up here with us. So, Chief, please go ahead. It is biggest fan so far. <laughs> it is not just my my <coughs> fan. So, I'm a business partner. We got together a lot. Um, as okay. a big as a big man collecting big money. I just wanted to right. contribute briefly on the dollar thing because I was driving. I was getting over. I knew once I get to my my legends will take over. Um, it's, 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 it's a pretty conversation for all of us, especially we in the industry as well. I'm also a broker and you're always quoting in dollars, but the point is most of the points Eddie and the other guys enumerated are valid. That's the reason why we, we, we quote in dollars. Um, but again, also we need to note one, the property market, it's also not just for Ghanaians. It's, just, it's also not just for locals, right? Most of properties that are bought are either funded or actually directly bought by Ghanaians in the diaspora or people. So when it gets sort of a, an international standard, international currency that everybody can relate, because people have never lived in Ghana before, and you're quoting the price to them, and they're not going to do conversions and all that. And it doesn't just happen in Ghana. I mean, globally, a lot of products are actually um, quoted in dollars. Even hotel prices, all the hotel prices in Ghana um, are mostly quoted in dollars and also relate. So that's... A um, the the second thing is that our currency now the currency has arrested us now. There's nothing we can do. The guy who said he was going to arrest it couldn't arrest it. It has arrested him. So, for example, if I have a property in Cantonment that is selling for one million dollars, that wants me to quote in Ghana cities, how much am I going to quote? I how many million? Eight trillion Ghana cities or what? Um, if you want to quote in Ghana cities, or pay, 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 pay. it just won't make any sense. So the best thing is to quote it in dollars. It works. And as the thing about the Bank of Ghana um, um, directives, look, this is about the fourth or fifth time 
since I go into industry, I'm, I'm seeing a letter like that. And there's a circular and there's a policy that don't quote in dollars and do it. But we all end up quoting in dollars and we all end up transacting in dollars, including the government itself. Because, it, and I, I always I start from home. Look at this. Every money we borrow is quoted in dollars. Every project we do is in dollars. When you are talking about GDP, it's in dollars. When you are talking about everything, it's in dollars. So you, the person who is pushing the policy yourself, is not talking. Is not talking in cities. How is it the private developer is supposed to talk in cities? At least what I know now is that most developers or most uh, property owners accept the CVD equivalent. Even that is another conversation. This one will say this is my dollar uh, uh, um, price. This one will say this one. This one. This one is this my dollar uh, conversion. This one is this my dollar conversion. But usually we end up using other BOG rates at the time or the, um, the, the receiver's bank's rate, right? But at least now that's a good thing. Most people will allow you. In the past, they won't even accept the CD conversion. They will ask you to go and change it in dollars and make that payment. So all these factors, look, the honest truth of the matter also is that our industry, one of the biggest problems in our industry is that it's so unregulated. There's a lot of issues with this industry. It's just a matter of It's just a matter of policy. It's so unregulated, there's no policy, and there's no, even if there's a policy, it's not enforced right. If it was a lot of things we have done right, the importations will reduce, um, land tenure issues will reduce, um, um, even prices itself will come down so much. Before I go into this, uh, this industry, I used to pray so well that real, real estate industry in Ghana should collapse so that we all benefit from it. But knowing what I know now, it's not going to collapse. In fact, I don't want it to collapse. Even if you, even if we collapse, it's not in any way because there's so much going on that beyond you and I, you will never understand. But that's what is sustaining the industry. And that's what makes things keep getting more expensive. And we can't do anything about it. It will start from the top. Thank Sorry, you so much. Was not your mark. Okay. <laughs> that was quite a good um, expose Chief has given us. Um, so, yes, uh, not yet death to the industry, but he's explained some things to us for us to understand it better. So, guys, again, even if it's quoted in dollars, you can ask for the CD equivalent uh, price to work with okay great so let, let's move on from the from the dollar matter and let's go on to talk about when you are building the kind of modifications you can make and it's a major challenge people have, uh, face that causes cost overrun so adam what, what's your take on it okay so generally from a quantity severe point of view i always fight my architects when they are changing they are making changes because it means that I have to go back and revise my estimates. But like uh, with everything, when you want to change, changes can be a very um, expensive adventure to embark on. So normally I realize that these things come up as a result of poor planning. And one of the things I wanted to even say at the beginning is that if you are building, it's planning, 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 and planning again. It's very, very important because when you start at the beginning, what is it that you want as you're speaking to your architect and the architect is trying to get the designs out of your head in terms of your, when you, you receive what they call your brief. Okay, they come up with the designs, you go through it together, you make changes and all of that. When the work starts at execution stage, it's very, very, very important that you limit the kind of modifications and the changes you do because some changes can be very costly. And once you, you start some of these changes, before you realize you are doing another change, you're doing another change because sometimes when you are changing something, like I said, the whole idea of a design is that you are putting so many things together and so many considerations. So sometimes when you are saying, oh, I want the room to face this way rather, as you're changing it, it's affecting something else that um, it's quite important. Then you realize that, no, you've caused another mistake somewhere here. So it's not a simple thing as, oh, I want another door here. Probably put another door here and it's open into another space or might be blocking something from somewhere else. You know, So when you are doing all these changes um, so much so that um, it causes too much cost to you, the client, so some people to the problem I see is that, oh, some of the clients, they visited somebody in their home and they saw some, hey, okay, they come and tell the architect, I saw this thing in uh, 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 Mr. Mensah's home. Oh, I want the same thing in my, in my building. And then 
because you are the client, that's what you want. So we try to put it in there. And sometimes what we come out with is not exactly uh, the best because we are trying to fit and improvise things. So it's very, very important that at the beginning, you plan, what is it that you want? Okay, I want a three bedroom house. I want this, I want this, I want this. You put everything together as much as possible. Let's try to limit the changes and you'll be fine. Some of the changes later on, you realize that you don't even know why you did them. You've just caused yourself a lot of um, cost for no reason. So let's limit those things. It's not like it cannot be done, it can, but each time you are breaking something, know that it's another cost. It's another mason you are calling back to come and do some other uh, block work. It's another mason or carpenter you are calling to come and do something else. And all these costs add up in the long run and make your project cost go overboard. So it's important that you decide what you want very early and then you work with it. Yeah, thanks. Every change is another carpenter. For for those of us who engage with carpenters, you know that you really don't want them to. You don't want to get involved with carpenters, especially when you have to pay for their materials ahead of time. But I think Jennifer, Jennifer was saying not too long ago that she got into a new place. She wanted a wardrobe or something, and the carpenter took the money for the materials, and now he's traveled. So, if you want to be having that kind of <laughs> that kind of drama, no stop. <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, I see a hand up, but we'll so I'll invite Elon, but we'll take another question before we hear from Elon so that when we are ready, Elon will be right on stage ready to talk. Okay, so um, let's switch back to buying, right? Uh, on the buying side, Eddie, I'm coming back to you. So, what are the steps involved in building in, in buying a house? We looked at the steps involved for um building i can imagine that the, one of the first steps you see is get a broker right but are there any more besides what you've said that people need to look out for great great thank you for your question i'm happy to answer this one because it's very important um number one get a broker professional broker number two um when you meet your broker for me, the most important step is to let them understand exactly what you need. Number of rooms, single story, double story, size of compound, what kind of locality would you like? And also disclose things that, you know, um, you know, things that govern your life on a daily basis. What do I mean? If you're married, where do your kids go to school? Where do you work? Things like that. Because the want you don't want is that you end up going to buy a house and the house becomes a burden to your everyday commute, your everyday life, your kids don't sleep. So many of these things have to be discussed from day one. Now, if you've crossed that discussion stage, the next thing is obviously we will do the viewings. Now, you, you have to trust your broker to show you at least three or four good options. I always limit it to maximum four. After viewing, you've seen a property you like, okay? You can then request the documentation or a copy of a site plan okay and then you begin to involve a lawyer and then you start to do a search the fact that you've seen a house and it's sitting in the airport hills or it's sitting in wherever laboni or it's sitting in maybe i don't know east legon hills doesn't necessarily mean that you should make payment tomorrow morning and and i think this is the point i want to hit on a lot please don't cut corners with the whole search process with the whole paperwork process because that is where a lot of people go wrong and they end up in court for five years, six years, eight years, 10 years. Okay. So the steps are very simple and I'm trying to outline them. Now, once you are done with the whole paperwork stuff, the search and your, your lawyer has approved and said, fine, everything is fine. The documentation that, you know, we've checked everything is fine. Then you can now go ahead to, you know, um, you know, to the transaction table. Now, one of the important, one of the reasons why you have to really engage a broker and not do this thing yourself is that most brokers who have good relationships with owners and landlords can also negotiate the best price for you and also the best payment plan. So when you also engage your broker, it is your duty to open up to them on your finances. What are your payment terms? Oh, the house is $100,000. How much of that money do you have now? How much of it will come from a mortgage? How much of it would you like as a payment plan? If you don't disclose these things, it will come back to haunt you because now 
the the ball is in your court, the offer is on the table, paperwork is done, and then you can't even cough the money. At this point, if you engage a broker, you have to pay. If you engage a lawyer, you have to pay. And you are incurring more cost for money you might not really have in the interim. So once you get to that point, paperwork is done, you know, transfer is done, you're able to sign your documentation. Then you can go ahead to make your payment. Now in this business, please don't play with paperwork, receipt, invoices. All those things are important. Don't wire money to somebody that you are buying a house. There's no track record. There's no trail. There's no payment advice. There's no invoice. There's no receipt. Because these are things that if something goes wrong, you will need as evidence in the court of law. Okay. And then once the whole transaction is done, then the broker will ensure that they do a handover. We call something handover. That's the day they'll hand over your keys, make sure that everything is fine in the house and you take possession of your first home. So that's the simple step. It's not a very cumbersome process if you involve the right professionals and you don't cut corners. I want you to go home with this one. Please don't try and cut corners because I've seen too many people that cut corners and today they can't even sleep at night. It haunts them and it keeps haunting them. So please, if you're on this call, engage the right professionals and trust them. If you get the right professionals, trust me, the process will be so, so, so straightforward and seamless for you that you go to bed smiling at the right side of your mouth. Thank you. I, I, I know some people really love a good night's sleep. So guys, you may need to make sure that you don't cut corners so that you can sleep well at night. Mimi, um, I, I noticed the question you posed in the chat and I think Eddie touched on it. Uh, the benefits of having a, a broker instead of going directly. Is that in, uh, um, is it satisfactory or you'd like to follow up? I would like some more information. I mean, beyond negotiating for a better rate, um, which I think may be advantageous depending on the situation I am in. Maybe I have some relationship with whoever the developer is or something. So I I just wanted to know beyond this negotiating a good, um, you know, amount for me, is there anything else or any other advantage that comes with dealing with a broker other than going directly because it comes at a cost so um there should be some value in 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 that relationship okay so good question but let me let me hit on it okay now aside the whole negotiation process and all that i I mean i'm a broker clients that engage me the whole process they don't even have to do anything. And I'm sure Chief Cosmos on the call will say it. When you have a professional broker, the entire purchase process, you as the buyer, you can focus on your main hassle, your main job. If you're a banker, you can sit in the bank and focus. The problem is that when you decide to do things on your own, you'd you'd have so much headache. Today, you are at Lance Commission chasing set results. Tomorrow, you are meeting the owner for dinner to discuss the price. Tomorrow, they give you the document and because you don't want to involve a lawyer, you are carrying the document here, going to la that they cut upon yourself and you are going to engage so many people during the process that you might not have a relationship with. So the fact that you know the developer doesn't necessarily mean that it's advantageous for the entire process because it's one thing to know the developer and get a good price and it's another thing to close the sale. There's an entire process which will involve other professionals. So that broker you are engaging, most professional brokers have relationships with lawyers, developers. We even have friends and lands commission and others. So we can help facilitate the process and make it seamless for you. I've seen people that can do a search. It can take one week or two weeks. But if you engage at the Aqua, I can give you your search results within 48 hours. You, you get it because you might know the developer, but you might not know the guy at Lamps Commission. And without that search result, you yourself cannot even go to the bank to make the payment. Because even though you know Kwesi from high school 20 years ago, you, you, you are not confident to give him the money yet because you can't be, you, you, are not, you, you don't have facts and figures. And if that transaction goes wrong, you'll find yourself in court. And trust me, I've met clients that try to cut this broker corner and then, they, oh, I know the landlord. We went to school, da 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 And they go and do the thing themselves. And now problems come and they come back to your office and they start crying. So just it's not just the negotiation process. It is the fact that the broker holds your hand, guides you from day one to the end. I don't even leave my clients after the sale 
we even do an you know an after sale business where we'll make sure that things that have warranty you know make sure that things work even if sometimes you buy a house you still have to buy other things you might need a generator you might need somebody to do solar you might need bits and pieces we 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 help you even after the sale so the relationship with the broker is very important that's why you also have to tell them the truth and be honest with them from day one so that they can help you and then everybody is happy at the end of the day so those are the things you have to look for to be very honest and if you if you try to do this thing on your own let me give you an example even finding the right property without a broker can be cumbersome are you going to take three days off work to drive around to find houses that's so much work. When a broker has a website with 500 properties and all you have to do is have a five minute conversation with him and he can pull out the best four options from the entire property market, send it to you and you'll be spoiled for choice. Are you getting the point? So there are so many advantages. All the things you might try to do in the process, we've already done it because that is our daily job. Are you getting it? So we have knowledge. We can educate you can advise you oh hundred thousand dollars no maybe you you are thinking of oebo but i have something close to chado it might even make more sense because your kids go to school at morning star what do you think Mm, are you getting it so we bring value to the table that's why as long as you are honest and you open up to us as brokers you tell us what exactly you want and we ask you the questions and you answer rightly we can give you a solution. So we are not just selling your house. We are providing you a solution throughout the whole purchase process. And I hope this, um, you know, gives you more clarity. Thank you. Thank so, you. Eric, you can I keep in? Please, Chief, go ahead. Good. I know I said a lot, but please let me add. Please, we, we need money. Eh? You have to engage brokers so that we also make money. That's one important. <laughs> Provided um, employment. He spoke about love. He spoke about love things. So, Funny story, right? Um, there's a client I was looking who was looking on the office, and and they I, I know they've been looking for a while. They were not too sure whether they wanted to get an office or not. But before they decided, they were looking around, and then they, they decided, okay, now we need an office. We need to set up ASAP. They go in touch with me, and I took them to a place. And like I was like, ah, but if I passed it to the to my house, so how can I never saw this place? So that's that's one of the things Eddie was talking about. We have the property. You may be seeing a property every day. You may not even know whether it was up, it's up for rent or up for, up, for, up for sale. And we lead you to rent. And I, that's, that's the honest truth. Like, we did, if I don't have it, I know I'll call it. Don't worry, you call another colleague. Like, we always have so much to go with the broker. And the for to simplify one of the things you said, right? Take the broker like your guru boy. Mm? The, guru, the broker is like your guru boy. So... I, I, that's how most people refer to us anyway but that's the thing once you want a property you have the money you see the property you like the rest of the job leave it to him because he only makes money he or she only makes money after the deal is closed so he's even more eager to close it more than you right so follow up on this document do this do this i mean there's a deal that i was closing last year was supposed to close within three weeks ended up taking eight months at the end of the day beyond managing the sale process you're also managing emotions because buyer, buyer at some point thinks we are being impatient, seller is angry because you are going to give promise and you are bringing it and the money is not coming. So you are managing emotions, you are managing people. It's always because here's what I say if you are buying a property, let's say 100, 100, worth 100k, right? And agent is charging you 30% or 5%. I mean, I usually go with 30% for those who are buying, right? 30% of 100k, that's how much? Is it $10,000? maybe yeah three thousand dollars i mean if you can afford to pay if you can afford to raise hundred thousand dollars the rest is just three thousand dollars it's a lot of money but it's not too much money to get the right things being done and the after sales that's another conversation altogether we sold a house to a chinese guy last year do you remember accountant right up to now almost yeah, one year. every year we are solving issue first uh, they, they, we want them to come and do uh what's that thing they call um sorry i mean every day is another issue because it turns out it's a great house but when it rains it goes into the house right and there's something we already didn't see and you're chasing mr seller mr seller has collected his money six hundred and thirty thousand dollars he moves he's moved on to the next project you don't have time to be uh, responding to email so we sometimes we have to drive to his office make sure we are getting at the right time so i mean that's 
that cannot be over overemphasized. I think you need a broker. Absolutely. Now let me add the final thing. Now assuming you don't get a broker, you do it your own way based on whatever relationship and things go bad. I pretty much think that you spend more money in court than how much you would have paid the broker as a broker's commission. And that's something you can think about. Thank you. Charlie, the money you will spend in court to resolve that issue is like David said in the chat. It's like insurance. You, you never realize how important they are until it hits you and it's too late. David, beyond what you wrote in the chat, do you want to voice out any more thoughts on this? Oh, um, so based on what our, uh, our brokers have, have said, I, I agree with them 100%. Um, my thoughts, because I, I, the world that I live in is different from the world that we're describing, the rules and regulations are different. So, you know, anything I say might be, might sound like, you know, rich people problems or something like that. So I'll just be quiet and let you guys speak. But uh, I agree with what they're saying. You want to have an agent I mean, a broker to do it for you. It's much seamless that way. They handle, with, they handle so much stuff that you as an individual, if you're going um, to go buy direct art, you may not have time to do, or it might be overwhelming for you to do so. Thank you. Okay. There is a lot of lessons I've learned from what Eddie and Chief just shared. For me, the biggest takeaway in the benefits of a good broker, emphasis on a good broker, emphasis on a good broker is that they have friends at places like lands commission charlie now nah, i can't leave my office with my suit and tie and go and chase around these kind of things my brother you will spend your whole day there and you have no results <laughs> <laughs> man we gonna we did charlie we gonna we did okay so um to anyone who just joined the conversation we are discussing the decision for your first home to buy or to build it we have uh two experts here in fact now i see three experts here on the building side we have edwin danjo he is a, a quantity severe and he's also had some personal experience besides his professional experience of building helping people build houses and he'll tell us about the pet project he's doing pretty soon we also have eddie aqua and chief cosmos here um talking about the buying side of things and we they just talked about the importance of having a broker so next up we are going to hear from elon elon you have a question for us please go ahead so um it, it's not exactly a question i was trying to add up to what uh, adam said i mean uh, good evening everyone and thank you for uh, giving me the giving me the chance to speak i want to i, I wanted to touch on the changes bit of the whole thing um so Adam has already uh, given some insight on what changes does to a design. And uh, I, I am an architect and for me as an architect, uh, you know, we, we uh, like to indulge the client up to a certain point. Um, it is normally during the, de the design stage, um, you try and get from the client everything he wants to do, everything that his money or his budget can afford. Sometimes you do a design for someone, then just as you're about to hit the ground or just, uh, or maybe when construction has already commenced, the client has um, hit some jackpot somewhere and suddenly wants to do some massive changes to the design. Um, for architects, we have... Um, what we call abortive design where you have to go back to the drawing board make sure that you have firmed up the design uh, really well before you hit you know the site again what you know every change that is called for on a, a project constitutes a variation and a variation can be in cost or it can it, it can really stress you so um i'm just adding to it sometimes changes would at one point frustrate the contractor all of this dollar increment trying to amend cost i mean it's it's just a lot so i would like to like if you are intending to build and you have a dream you have uh, like a vision i mean try to get everything 
you know done within the design you know stage so that it doesn't cost you at the end especially for small projects sometimes when we are net clients can just come on to the project you know wall away uh, break this wall wall down uh, put this door here you know just as adam said but at the end you are not even even able to track your you know your your course you are not even able to um do some proper you know project management with all of those um uh, requests that is coming in so that that's a little on um the the changes that i wanted to touch on with permits um i just wanted to say you know we don't have any um clear formula for um kind of a clear formula for arriving at some of the fem uh, permit uh, fees that we pay um ju just recently i'm working on a project in uh, east legon we went to adma try to get a demolition code for um a seven bedroom house so that we could um, um raise it up in another style when i went the guy asked me to pay eight thousand i said eight thousand what is the basis for this eight thousand uh, quote that you are giving me? Oh, I was see yes, yeah, DB. I was see yes, yeah, DB. I was like, yeah, you must be saying. So, um, I was told that if I don't know anybody there and I go and you know raise my shoulders like I'm a professional, so give me, um, like a, a, a sure formula, I might not be given at all or be attended to. So I had to negotiate with the guy. So we came to about five thousand. Now, when it was time for me to go get the permit and the receipt, I saw 2000 on the receipt and I hear you can't even complain. So, I mean, that's, those are some of the things that is, you know, um, worrying us in this, um, our, there's no clear formula. There's no clear basis for, you know, um, chasing some of these things. And uh, that is a stress we go through when we, um, want to build. So I just wanted to add, uh, you know, share my small experience and thank you for giving me the chance. Uh, I'll pass on the mic to uh, Elikim. Thank you. Thank you, Elo. Wow. A moment of silence for the corruption in Ghana. Just sad. Oh, it's not only the politicians who do it right, but um, yeah, it's, it's the way that is the way that Ghanaians live. People want to get freebies, people want to use their positions to take advantage. So it's the cost of doing business and it is passed on to us and we all have to pay for it. So you just need to be aware of the, the lay of the land. Thank you Alon for coming up. So to our audience, you can see we have a strong team of experts in the real estate industry here. Do follow them, add them, Eddie, Chief, Elom, follow them so that you can ask them any questions you have. Send them messages if you are considering building or buying. Reach out to them at any point. You know, and just remind them that it's, it's through Money Convos that you you heard about them. Um, yeah, and in case you are also thinking beyond real estate or even thinking about how to finance this purchase, we had some previous conversations about loans and mortgages. So just follow us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and you would see the links to the previous conversation so that you can go and listen again or send us DMs on those um, on those social, social media platforms so that we can answer any related questions for you. All right, so we are coming to the end of our conversation very soon. So if you have any more questions on the topic, please do raise your hand or drop it in the chat so that we can attend to it before we end. But um, coming, I'll just come back to the building, to the buying side of things. Eddie, you've you've talked so much. You've talked so much about um, the industry and the mistakes. You've anticipated a lot of the questions I was going to ask, right? But now I'm curious. Just going back to the issue of people can find their own brokers. I see websites websites like Tonaton. I see websites like Mikasa. How, how am I supposed to interact with these websites? Do I just go there to get an idea of the prices and find a, an actual broker? Or should I just ignore them and go, go for an actual broker? What do you think? Um, this question, <laughs> I think, um, you see, we are in an e-world now, okay? So 
somebody might not know any broker. So the first thing he might go on Google and type house to buy in Accra. What might pop up might be a Mikasa. Now Mikasa will give you a property. Every property has a broker that listed it. So what I will do in that point is that I might not know anybody, but if I've seen a broker's name, I'll try to also Google that broker. Now any professional broker should have a website. So then you can have a bit of, it's like you're doing due diligence. You know, if a company wants to give me a job or whatever, I'll go maybe www.stambigbank.com to see what they do, what departments do they have. Maybe they might have some, you know, um, client feedback, customer, you know, reviews, things like that. Then you can decide that, oh, I've seen four brokers from mikasa.com, but I think I want to call this one because of so many factors. And that's why an online presence is important. Okay, on the other hand too, referrals always work. Now, I think that, 80% of the deals I close will come from referrals and Cosmos can say the same. So referrals are the easier way to go. Um, Elikem knows me. I've done some stuff with him in the past. He says, call Eddie and that's it. You don't waste your time going online because going online can also be tedious. Now you might have five, 10 options. Who do you call? Do you want to engage 10 brokers? Too much work. So it goes both ways. It depends on your situation, but it's always good to go with a referral or somebody that has, you know, somebody you can trust. And if you're not too sure, you can also engage two or three. You know how it's like comparing quotes. Maybe I want to buy um, a, a gadget. I can take a a, a, um, a quote from CompuGana. I can take another quote from maybe Game and ShopRite and compare. You can also decide to give three professionals, you know, um, a chance to prove themselves in quotes or even how they engage you from day one, you can end up knowing that, oh, this is the guy I want to go with this one. No, I don't think because he's not ABC. So it's always good to go that way. But if somebody gives you a referral, then it must be very powerful. Please go ahead. Or else if you're on this call, just contact myself or Cosmos and we're happy to assist you. You can also spread out, you know, spread the word. This is like an advert for ourselves. I mean, I, I believe we are very good at what we do. That's why we get a lot of the reviews and we, we, we've delivered a lot of solutions over the years. So if you're not sure of who to contact and you don't have time to go online and do any of this due diligence, just call Ediaqua or Cosmos and we'll be happy to assist you through the process. Thank you. Yep, 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 you heard it. When in doubt, in fact, regardless whether in doubt or not, just call Eddie and Cosmos. <laughs> David, you wanted to chip in? Yeah, I wanted to find out. Um, oh boy, I'm even scared. Um, I wanted to find out if um, being a broker, a mortgage broker, it's something that you, you're licensed for. And if, let's say, a layman like me trying to find a mortgage broker or a real estate broker, I can log on to some website and see all the people who are licensed in Accra, for instance, if I want to buy a house in Accra, and maybe I might have some bio or something. Is there a, a resource to help find these things? Great question. I think that, so this question is, I love the question because this is the process that is actually trying to be created now. It's never been there. Um, like Cosmo said, our industry has a lot of loopholes and, you know, gaps and all that in the past. So it is now that they are trying to regulate it a bit, bring some sort of license numbers and create a database for professional property brokers in Accra or Ghana so that you can then see that bio you are looking for. I, I'm sure the question is coming because maybe you are probably international. You probably don't live here. You are used to the UK or USA or Canada way of doing things, which is fine. I used to work out there as well. So I know that that system is very different you can literally get all these things online and know who to go with but unfortunately Ghana we are not there yet so we are in the process okay, hopefully we we'll get there soon thank you you see this is why sometimes I'm scared to ask my questions then I come off like you know <laughs> okay, I don't know how <laughs> what do you mean by that? You it know? means that you have Ghana at heart. So God, I God do, I do, it. but I, I have to remember that we, we deal in with different set of rules. So, oh, Charlie, but thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's okay. You have, you have, you have, you mean well, and we get it. Um, <laughs> as for lines, they forget what's happening, however, is that, um, so there have been spots of groups. I mean, there have been a couple of groups that have, been, that have sprung up. Right, or trying to sort of um, put agents in sort of a professional body. So there's there's a group of it's Ghana Real Estate uh, Practitioner Association. There's another one. There's another. I mean, for some of us, we actually intend to form like a chamber. 
so like a chamber of red estate brokers right but the truth is that there wasn't any policy supporting this from the beginning the real estate act i think was passed recently and it's the idea to constitute a board and then the board will sort of make sure all these things get done so i'm pretty confident within the next maybe year or two depending on where government interest is and whoever is pushing the agenda we will get to that and then we can face it out because the truth is that for we brokers as well even here there are a lot of telewati agents within the system and when i say telewati agents he knows what i mean right um so you see the regular guy who was probably a mason or a plumber or a carpenter who was building some house for somebody and before he finished the landlord told him that oh then we are maybe rent you and i met him and then the guy why one way or the other is able to strike it you get somebody to come rent it and then he knows oh there's money from real estate so it takes commission and now he's happy and cause it's of an agent so he stops he drops the carpentry job or he's doing it on the side and he's not a broker he has no idea about real estate he's a guy who if you calls me to come and show your house finish his college is 50 ghana and then he's following up for commission so those are there and there's those of us who i mean again who have gone to school have been trained who have been schooled maybe not necessarily in real estate because i didn't go to real estate school but i've learned it i mean graduated done business done uh, work with some intentional development agencies and they actually studied real estate did a masters in that line so there's that and then there's the regular guys right so when you meet them you see the difference it will be in control right you see and i mean it was a time i met a client and i was wearing a suit and driving my car i picked there up went and again after you an agent i said yes like she was confused because she's just used to agents who will meet you with some bag hanging at the corner and wearing chalo and says he wants moving fee right so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um even now even though there are no lines and no number numbers if you want to find the right ones you will find them trust me i mean you will find them and at the time the licenses and all that will be done and we are we are so so really excited about that yep well answered okay that's great that's great thank you ad and chief for helping us clarify that so all too soon we've come to the end of our conversation so in case you were wondering to buy or to build i guess the answer is very simple or oh, no i can say it simply but it's not that simple the answer is it depends it depends on what you need and uh we've had adam speaking about building elom also supported with a few points on there and on the buying side we've had ad and chief telling us about the buying and we started a conversation with the pros and cons so if you join the conversation late or you are listening to we started listening just midway please go back to the start in the replay after the room ends you can hit replay and then get it from the top where we took on the pros and cons of um, buying and building so you, so that you can make up your your mind but if you are still not sold on this conversation it's always best to get someone's hand to uh, to get someone to hold your hand in this process so reach out to any of us on stage especially Adam Eddie Chief and Elom you can um our speakers please just drop your handles in the chat so that people can know where to follow you so that uh, they, they can continue these conversations with you one-on-one -on -one later all right so um next week on on money convos on monday at 7 p.m we continue with our book review on youtube and that is a is a youtube live session this week we had a we had David joining us to discuss Who Moved My Cheese, a book about change. We will continue next week, Monday. We will continue on Monday with Brian and Jennifer. Then um, on Thursday, we'll be having a case study. Maybe he's bringing us an interesting case study. A what would you do kind of story. If it were you, what would you do? That kind of case study. Or Mimi, no be so. Okay, I caught Mimi off guard. No worries. Bye, yeah it's more of a learning experience so we are taking you back to class but with something more practical so um we look forward to that follow us on facebook instagram twitter and um do let us know your thoughts any ways that we can bring you more financial literacy uh conversations we just want to help you on your path to building your wealth we want to help people create and build wealth from whatever level of income that they are and yes, of course, we would also like some support too. So a major place that we will need support is we want to test out Twitter. 
So in the perhaps in May, we would we'll like to have our first Twitter space. So if you are on Twitter, please go and follow us so that when, when we do that space, you'll be notified and you join. And um, if you have any ideas for us, do let us know. That first session, we will be talking about why money confers. Why does David come here every Thursday judiciously as if someone is checking attendance? Why does Mimi do a lot of work in the background to make sure that things are moving? Why does Elikem come here and talk plenty? All for your financial education and for your your financial well-being, right? And we would also be sharing some ex experiences we've had. We would be calling on other people we've engaged with to also share their testimonies. So please don't miss out that on that session, that Twitter space when we do have it in May. Getting closer, we will announce the exact date, but we look forward to having you all. But don't worry, we are not running away from Clubhouse just yet. We just want to test it out, you know, different avenues to do, reach more people okay guys thank you so much eddie thank you so much adam thank you so much chief and thank you so much Elon, for gracing our occasion and coming to bless our audience with your knowledge i'm sure that some someone out there would be saved a huge cost because they were just about to cut corners and but because of you they won't cut corners they'll get a right broker get a good um architect or key west to help them with their building project thank you all so much and talk to you goodbye goodbye thank you too goodbye Good night, thank everyone. you for having me thank you thank you for taking the time to listen to our thoughts i hope you learned a thing or two and start practicing don't forget to follow us on twitter instagram clubhouse and facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast. Do tell a friend about Money Convos so we all become wealthy together. Talk to you soon. Bye.